1974 came the big discovery. Fred Wendorf, an anthropologist from America, and his colleagues were traveling in the desert. They stopped for a rest and they stopped in a place that today we call Napta Playa. They quickly realized that this was a prehistoric site. And one of the most extraordinary discoveries on this site was this calendar circle. What they had found here was a ceremonial site, mainly to do with the observation of the sky. We now know that the origins of the pharaonic civilization comes from the western desert in the extreme southwest of Egypt. Before we start, let's read a quote from Black Genesis. Facts are facts. Egypt is in Africa, Egyptians are Africans, and there is now overwhelming evidence that ancient Egyptians have a Black African origin. Who exactly wrote that? Robert Bouval was born in Egypt in 1945 and began studying Egyptology in 1983. His research is featured in worldwide media and he wrote a scientific thesis that he calls Black Genesis with his colleague Thomas Brophy, who is an astrophysicist PhD out of NASA. Robert and Dr. Brophy have dedicated many years of their lives to go back in time, to a time most of us don't even think about. Robert himself says that Black Genesis has become not only a scientific thesis, but also a testament of respect and admiration of all who have a direct ancestral line to Africa. Black Genesis also says there is still much work to do in bringing to the world a new and proper vision of the Black African origins of civilization. Let's take a trip to the western desert of Egypt, where we'll find this amazing civilization that moved to the Nile River at the very moment in history that Egyptian civilization reared its head. When the desert became super dry, and their animals died, the Napta people migrated to the Nile. Robert Bouval was born in Egypt and had the Great Pyramid framed in his window every day for many years. He'll tell you in two seconds that these black African Egyptians eventually started mixing with these other people and that these black non-Nubian Egyptians can still be found in Upper Egypt today as an ancestral population. This was already measured at Gurna where the DNA told us that these people were related to Ethiopians. Probably on a campfire like this that the star people, the prehistoric star people of the desert would sit every night and watch the constellation. The Egyptian Sahara it. is a vast region deep to the west of the Nile Valley. This is a wall of desolation almost the size of France. Other than the five oases, this place is considered the most desolate place on earth, especially in that southwest corner. But here today, we will be revealing living evidence of people who left their living marks in this desolation. But one of those was the subject of Mutuhotep II, that great African unifier of Upper and Lower Egypt. There are two highland regions here called Gilf Kabir and Jebel Uwayanat. These are giant bodies of rock rising up from the flat landscape like eerie mirages that can taunt, daunt, and terrify the most intrepid or placid of travelers. 
you're going to be seeing the first brave people in modern history to explore this desolation we call the Western Desert. And what they found there was of the extraordinary type. Before we get into that, we should know first that Napta Playa and the Kabir Uwayana areas are almost on the same east-west line that runs just north of latitude 22.5 degrees north. This forms a kind of natural highway between the Nile Valley, Napta Playa, and at the end, Gil Kabir and uh, Jebel Uwayana. This is an important factor that we'll need to keep in mind as we take this journey. This helps to explain how much of the archaeological remains from these areas end up being associated with Nubian cultures. These new discoveries have in fact widened the Ethiopian scope of influence and clears the fog as to how Nile Saharan and Afro-Asiatic people penetrated to the west. Until recently, only a handful of people had gone into this wilderness, and it was so uninteresting to Egyptologists that the information presented here today is hardly mentioned in any of but the rarest of Egyptology books. Despite this knowledge, all we get from Eurocentric Egyptologists is close-up pictures of Rahotep, or their own drawings. So who would dare to go into this desolation to explore it? Well, we have to go back to the 1920s, when an abundance of rock art on ledges and caves and in the wadis was found. In comes Hassanin Bey. The Geographical Society of London has ranked Mr. Bey as the greatest desert explorer of all times. The director of the desert survey at the time referred to Hassanin's desert explorations as an almost unique achievement in the annals of geographic exploration. To make a long story short, by the early 1920s, he decided that he finally wanted to head into the uncharted and unexplored territory of the southwestern desert of Egypt. Robert quotes Hassanin in Black Genesis here, saying, Here at last I was plunging into the untraversed and the unknown. He also says that he will be going through a region hitherto untrodden by any one of his own kind, and make, perhaps, some small contribution to the sum of human. On his journey, he came across the people that were living in this strange land. Here you see photos taken by this daring explorer himself, right here on this channel. He eventually makes it to Uena, which is about as far southwest in the Egyptian universe as you're going to get, unless you're going to Yale. Dr. Brophy writes here that Hassanin met up with King Harry of Uena who showed him some ancient rock carvings. Not lingering very long, he did write that it was here in Uenat that he made the most interesting find of his 2200 mile journey. Black Genesis says that many decades later, scholars will begin to see in them the origins of the pharaohs and quite possibly indeed of We can see on our screen right here, the Tebu of the Sahara. These here are the descendants of ancient North Africans, living in places no European had ever been to. Robert and Dr. Brophy write here that the Tibesti and Nedi highlands in northeastern Chad have an abundance of rock art similar to Uwainat that suggests a prehistoric This evidence tells us that people who were in Chad took their skills to this now desolate place and are currently residing in that area. Today, 350,000 Tebu still inhabit the Tebesti Mountains. Dr. Brophy and Duval write here that it is also very likely that the northeast of Chad and Uwenat rock arts have a common origin. They also write that it's likely that this location in Northeast Chad was the final destination of the famous Abu Balas Trail. It's also true and they say that an expedition starting from Uwainat headed to the Tibesti Highlands would be the next logical step in the search for the fabled Land of Yam. 
It was in this direction that Mentuhotep sent his people to meet up with the people from Yam. As proven by the inscriptions mentioning Mentuhotep II and Yam, located at Jebel Uwainai. But rather than go in this logical direction, we'll only get distractions from the Euro critics. Prince Kamal refused the throne of modern Egypt in order to be a desert explorer and a cartographer. This same Prince Kamal discovered an immense mountain range that he christened Gilf Kabir. This mountain range is 186 miles long and about 80 kilometers wide. When approached from the west, it juts out of the flat desert like a monstrous tsunami in stone. This is literally the southwestern door to Egypt's western desert and the actual door to tropical central West Africa. And we'll see later that the Prince Kemal missed the extensive prehistoric rock heart that is found on the west side of Gilf Kabir, which ended up being found by an explorer who was actually sponsored by Prince Kemal. Count Laszlo Almasi, who was said to have been a secret agent for the Germans in World War II. This location, discovered by Prince Kemal in 1926, Gilf Kabir, was the place in 1999 that Carlo Bergman discovered was part of an ancient highway that was used by both prehistoric people and Egyptian people. Bergman explored the region southwest of the Dakla Oasis on foot himself and discovered about 30 water stations with similar large clay Egyptian pots set equidistant to each other for 217 miles. Abu Balas Hill is the halfway point. So what we have is a highway from Dakla Oasis to Gilf Kabir. And then we have a natural highway that leads from Gilf Kabir and Jebel Uenat to Napta Playa and not the Nile Valley. This is something that needs to be factored in. Having said that, Black Genesis describes the discovery of these places as an intellectual explosion for the academics because here is hard, irrefutable evidence that the pharaohs did travel all the way into the deep desert after all. By 2007, several European anthropologists such as Croplin, Cooper, and Forster were pretty sure that the Abu Balas Trail went on beyond Gilf Kabir and on to Jebel Uenat and even to Chad. Then, Middle Kingdom inscriptions left by Mentuhotep II were found at Uenat pushing the Egyptians even further west than ever before. Here we can see for ourselves what the king left. This takes us up to the 1970s and now the playa, the reason why we're here today. On a long drive through the Egyptian Sahara, Fred Windorf and one of his students stopped for a bathroom break when they realized that they were surrounded by a field of artifacts, fine stone tools, and pot shirts. This prompted Windorf to investigate further and begin a brand new excavation site. What Windorf and his team didn't realize was that they were surrounded by groups of large stones half buried in the sand. Bouval and Brophy say that these stones would eventually shock the world's concept of antiquity. The excavators for a long time thought that these large stones were natural bedrock outcrops but they soon looked a little closer and noticed that these stones were positioned in unnatural formations. Strange geometrical clusters, ovals, circles, and straight lines. All on the sentiment of an ancient dry lake located about 62 miles west of Abu Simbel. Here we have another example of mystery stone circles, this time located in West Africa. Over a period of 2,000 years, perhaps a, a historical from heritage Africa. from a lost civilization. Windorf's teams had already determined that this was a Neolithic site before this development. So the questions now are who had done this, when did they do it, and why did they do it? These questions were routinely ignored 
by Eurocentric Egyptologists, but modern day brave explorers. But let's get back to Paul Wendorf. In 1972, Wendorf handed the reins to an anthropologist named Dr. Romuald Schill, who would go on to become a renowned anthropologist. This is where we get those famous papers with the name Wendorf and Schild. Both Wendorf and Schild admitted that there were no signs suggesting that a new archaeological dreamland was buried right there. But within a year, both men realized they had hit the anthropological jackpot because this was no ordinary prehistoric site. It was Wendorf and Schild who christened this place Napta Playa. Found there were strange groups of large stones in the western part of Napta Playa, at least 30 that the CPE called complex structures. Some of these were excavated and it was discovered that the structures were deliberately placed over natural rock outcrops that were 10 to 16 feet below the surface. Furthermore, these rock outcrops have been smoothed to mushroom type shapes by human hands. The largest of these structures is Complex Structure A, where we find a stone sculpture carved to look something like a cow. Above a sculpted rock outcrop. This same sculpture is now broken in half behind the Aswan Museum in Egypt. But right here on this channel, we have photos of this sculpture as it was being excavated. After discovering this site in the 70s, Windorf was still at work there with the astronomer Kim Malville. In 1998, when after 30 years of work, he wrote that the stones at Napta Playa, there in Lower Nubia, formed a series of stellar alignments radiating out from the site of the sculpture. Orion, Ursa Major, and Sirius, the mother of the pharaohs, are all attested. Sirius itself has a parade of six megaliths marking the rise of Sirius as it would have appeared 6,800 years ago. The point here is this information is not new and has been in the public for at least 40 years. Yet, the Eurocritics choose to pretend this place doesn't exist and is not worth mentioning or are busy working on a way to appropriate it to themselves. Radiating from this sculpture was a series of alignments for several hundred meters. Later, we'll see how these alignments match up to the pyramids up in Giza. Mr. Bouval and Dr. Brophy went to this place later and have noticed that many of the markers have been vandalized and trash has been dumped at some of these sites. There are also tours going to these places now too. And now tourists come and look what they have done. Collected Turks and grinding stones from here and there. And that is what we archaeologists have to fight against. That is a problem. It's one of the main targets of our, our the tour here. That we prevent tourists from doing so as we see it here. The Horus name of Khufu, of Cheops, the builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza. You see it here? This is a tooth of Jedefre, was the son of Cheops. Yeah. By the way, Carlo Bergmann interpreted it as the first map in the world. Because of what we see in this area here, we think that uh, there's still some people there. This uh, is very discussed alive. Wendorf and Schild, who published three decades of findings about Napta Playa for the Polish Academy of Science. They wrote that Napta Playa was an important ceremonial center in the late and final Neolithic. The complexity of the arrangements and enormous amount of closely managed work put into the construction of the megalithic constructions indicates that the cattle herders of the southwestern desert created an early complex society with the presence of a religious or political control over human resources for an extended period of time. I don't know about you, but this sounds suspiciously Egyptian to me. Need I remind you that Windorf was the first to get to work at this site 
and Shield has been described as a world-renowned anthropologist. These are no slouches. Even super Egyptians read their papers. If he did, then he would have seen the part where Windorf and Shield said that common contacts of the desert dwellers with the Nile Valley inhabitants are indicated by frequent presence of raw materials and ceramics originating in the Nile Valley. These Nile Valley inhabitants are almost always Nubian related. This is about 3,000 years before the Egyptian civilization. This is the actual time period covered when people come up with fantasy advanced civilizations that came before the Egyptians. Well, there you go, folks. So who exactly were these people? And where did they come from? Black Genesis tells us that Windorf and Schill published in 2002 that the physical anthropology of rare skeletal materials remains found in the early, middle, and late Neolithic suggests the so-called racial association with sub-Saharan African groups. They know these black people were also in the Napa Player region, which the archaeology has now told us featured a sub-Saharan African material culture. But getting back to Windorf and Shield, they echoed a reoccurring theme in Egyptology today. These contacts of cattle pastoralists, such as those at Napa Playa, with the pre-dynastic agricultural groups in the Nile Valley, may have played an important role in the emergence of a complex stratified society in the Great River Valley. And this echo is getting louder. David Wingro is stating the obvious here when he says it's been clear for decades that the later prehistory... Maria Gatto said he was right for looking south to Africa to put new villages at twist. Dr. Ashton said we need to look at things from an African context and the Manchester Museum held the spiritual successor to the UNESCO conference where they explored just that. The aim of Wingrove's article was to define an important horizon of cultural change belonging to the 5th millennium BC that linked Egypt's early development firmly to that of its southern neighbors in Nubia and central Sudan. The science has reached a point of frameworks and definitions for this pre-Egyptian time period. This is important to remember. David Wingro is not a lightweight. That's why everything presented here today agrees with him so easily. He talks about defining a clear break with the early Holocene past in the establishment throughout the entirety of the Nile Valley of a remarkably consistent set of concepts and material practices relating to the treatment of human bodies in this life and the next. After 30 years of study, Windorf and Shield wrote that the Naphtopalaya Basin is of particular interest because it has one of the longest and most complete occupations known in the Sahara. What that tells us scientifically and definitively is that all these Egyptian fantasies about advanced civilizations coming before the Egyptians somewhere right here and it would have been Nubian related. Just as Maria Gatto tells us here, when she says that what can be safely stated is that at this stage, the evidence points to an earlier presence of so-called Nubian population in the area. Along with the Eastern Desert, the Western Desert, Gilf Kabir, Jebel Uwinat, and the Dakla Oasis too. None of these cultures is ever identified as Proto-Indo-European. Absolutely whatsoever. I must also add that there is no such thing as an Egyptian identity at that time either. 
Now Fred Windorf not only discovered Naphtha Playa, he's worked there for at least 40 years. This is hands down one of the most important places in ancient Egyptian history, yet it's routinely ignored by the Euro critics. This leads us to magical Caucasians teleporting to the western desert in a massive land grab that destroys all African presence in the area. After many findings and 40 years, Windorf, Schill, Bouval, Dr. Brophy, and all the anthropologists that have worked this place over the years personally has never said even once that this place was dominated by any foreign cultural influence originating outside Africa. Wingrove has already told us there was a clear break with the early Holocene past. And when the dust clears, we see a realm of cultural influence from Egypt to central Sudan. 